Welcome to Cincinnati Sessions, a production of the University of Cincinnati Internal Medicine Residency. I'm your host, Danielle Weber. Today's topic is Bud Chiari Syndrome. Starting with your case, you have a 45-year-old healthy female who presents with constant right upper quadrant pain that started three weeks ago. The patient has now noticed worsening abdominal fullness over the last week in some edema. She takes no medications or over-the-counter pills, herbs, or supplements. She drinks one glass of wine a day and has no history of drug use, and her family history is otherwise unremarkable. On exam, she has mild jaundice, right upper quadrant pain with hepatomegaly and a positive fluid wave. Her labs reveal an AST and ALT of 252 and 266 with a T billy of 4.6 and an albumin of 3.5. Otherwise, CBC, renal, and INR are normal. So for this patient, what is the test of choice to evaluate for Bud Chiari syndrome? Pause the video and try to answer this question for yourself. If you're next to someone, present this case to them and discuss together. After you try to answer the question, resume the video. So let's review some anatomy. When we think about the blood supply for the liver, let's remember that there's a dual blood supply. We have blood coming from the portal vein, blood that is coming, that is draining the GI tract and the spleen. It's very nutrient rich and actually supplies two thirds of the liver's blood supply. The hepatic artery is arterial blood, providing one third of the liver's blood supply and is very oxygen rich. All this blood then drains through the liver and ultimately is drained by the hepatic veins into the IVC. If we zoom in on um, a micro scale and look at the histology, we can see that all of these things have branches within the liver. And as a reminder that in the center of the asini is the portal triad, where we have that branch of the hepatic artery, a branch of the portal vein, and these are both bringing blood in while it sits with the bile ductal that is draining bile out of the liver. So as blood comes in to this area, it then drains through the sinusoids, draining through those zones as it goes to that terminal hepatic venule. And as a reminder, because of this, there's the different zones in the liver are at differential risk for ischemic injury with zone three being particularly susceptible as it's further from that arterial oxygen rich blood supply. Bod Chiari is an obstruction of that venous outflow tract, really an obstruction of the hepatic veins or IVC. It's important to note that Bud Chiari syndrome does not include cardiac disease or pericardial disease, the um, other mechanisms by which we could have a post-hepatic liver dysfunction. It is specific to the obstruction of this venous outflow tract, either from primary causes, such as venous thrombosis or phlebitis of the veins, or secondary causes in which the vein becomes compressed or is invaded um, by a malignancy, for example. And all of this obstruction of the venous outflow tract ultimately leads to venous stasis and congestion within the liver. As we think about that on the micro scale again, this venous stasis and congestion really leads to ischemia and hypoxic injury to the liver cells. When there's ischemia, there's free radical release further leading to this hypoxic injury, and you ultimately get hepatic necrosis in those central lobular regions furthest from the blood supply. If this process continues, you'll eventually get central lobular fibrosis, then nodular regenerative hyperplasia, and ultimately cirrhosis. However, our body tries to compensate. So we're trying to prevent that progression to cirrhosis. So over time, our body will try to form collaterals, try to offload that pressure. And in this image here, you can see all the fuzziness around the branches of the hepatic veins. That's the collaterals you're seeing there. If we go back to this image, then we wanna think about what else can be happening. So we can form collaterals that we'll see on exam to offload that pressure. However, as time goes on, the caudate lobe can also hypertrophy. 
the caudate lobe of the liver seen down here, kind of in the brown behind the portal vein, actually drains directly into the inferior vena cava. And so in response to the liver necrosis, the caudate lobe will hypertrophy. And is, as this hypertrophies, it may compress the IVC. So ultimately, the patient could still come in with significant findings of ascites and lower extremity edema, more from this compression of the IVC. And if none of this happens, none of the collaterals or compensation happens, and the patient progresses to cirrhosis, they will additionally have um, ascites and lower extremity edema. So this makes diagnosing bud carry really tricky because presentations can be so variable. Patients can present acutely, like the patient in our case, where they had a rapid development of symptoms over the course of, a, of weeks. Patients frequently have that right upper quadrant pain and hepatomegaly when they present acutely and, and can have the ascites because no collaterals have formed. Rarely a patient can develop a form of fulminant acute bud Chiari syndrome. And this is defined by the patient who then progresses to developing encephalopathy within eight weeks of jaundice. However, patients may have a more subtle or insidious onset. So patients can present subacutely, and this is in large part due to the ability to form collaterals and also decreased disease burden. Those with subacute presentations are less likely to have thrombosis or involvement of all three hepatic veins. Patients who present subacutely may have just minimal um, ascites and minimal edema. They also may just have kind of vague epigastric or right upper quadrant pain initially. Others will present more chronically where they've had pretty minimal symptoms, um, but then progress to, to full cirrhosis and then present because of the symptoms of cirrhosis. So these patients um, can have all the typical signs and symptoms of cirrhosis coming in with ascites, lower extremity, lower extremity edema, and everything else. So it's important to consider Bud Chiari for a variety of presentations, including acute liver failure, acute hepatitis, and chronic liver disease. So how do we diagnose it? Well, since it's a problem with the veins, really ultrasound with Doppler um, evaluation of the veins is the diagnostic evaluation of choice. You can get a CT and, or MRI. However, um, that is not the preferred modality if ultrasound is readily available. Additionally, if someone does have a CT or MRI that is suggestive of Bud Chiari, it is still recommended that you confirm the diagnosis with an ultrasound. Phonography is also an option. However, this is invasive and is really only used in the cases where all other imaging modalities have been negative and you still have a high index of suspicion for Bud Chiari. So when we're thinking about our ultrasound, we're gonna be taking a look at the liver and we're trying to see those nice three hepatic veins. We want to see Peyton right hepatic vein, middle hepatic vein, and left hepatic vein. And we're getting the Doppler so that we can make sure that there's good biphasic waveforms um, in the veins. So on the left here, you can see an image of the Doppler where you see that nice biphasic blood flow. The image on the right here is showing uh, an absence of blood flow and you see a loss of that biphasic waveform. And this is confirming Bud Chiari syndrome. So for our case, what is the test of choice to evaluate for Bud Chiari? The answer, ultrasound with Doppler. Questions for reflection. What is the normal blood supply and venous drainage of the liver? Describe two ways a patient with collaterals can develop ascites and lower extremity edema. What are different ways a patient with Bud Chiari syndrome might present? Pause the video and try to answer these questions alone or with a friend. Try to say the answers out loud. If you have to, rewind the video to find the answers. And last, I'll leave you with a couple additional questions for reflection. What is the expected ascites protein level and SAG in Bud Chiari? What workup should be pursued to determine the etiology of Bud Chiari? 
Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Cincinnati Sessions. Here are my references and have a good day.